Sounds like somebody's car is getting robbed out there. You might want to check. Yeah, so uh, this morning, we're, we're in 1 Samuel 14. I invite you to open your Bibles to 1 Samuel 14. Uh, but we're going to do it a little bit differently this, uh, this morning. It's a great passage of Scripture. It's a great story. Uh, but it's a long one. It's a long passage, long story. I originally had intended to uh, break 1 Samuel 14 up into two, two passages and uh, work on the first half today and come back next week and work on the second half. Uh, but really, it just, the whole thing just kind of fits together as one unit. And I was, was really having a hard time to figure out where I'm going to split this thing up or, or even just do damage to the text that way. Uh, it really is this neat story that gives for us a, uh, just an intriguing comparison between King Saul and then his son Jonathan. Uh, so what we're going to do is I'm just going to be basically summarizing the story for you as we walk through it. And I'll be reading uh, certain passages, certain verses as we uh, go along through it. Again, not the way we normally do it, uh, probably not my ideal way of doing it, but uh, today that's how we're going we're gonna to walk through the text uh, this morning. And uh, so here's the other challenge with the text, too, is I found this week a practical application from this text a little bit difficult. And you'll see as we get into it, part of the reason I find application from this text a little bit difficult is because we don't have, as we work through this story, we don't have the narrator, you know, jumping in at certain points and saying, yeah, you see what happened right there? That's no good. Don't do that. (laughs) And see what this guy's doing over here? Yeah, that's good. That's what we're supposed to be doing there. Or you don't have Samuel coming in like we had him come in last week and say, Saul, how dare you? You know, uh, how dare you violate, you know, your responsibility before the people and wait patiently. How dare you sinfully overstep your boundary, right? We don't have any of that going on today in Samuel. And so we're left a little bit uh, trying to fend for ourselves in terms of making application. And I told Bill this morning, because he came in saying, yeah, today, this morning is a a kind of a weird morning. And I said, well, coincidentally, that's kind of the theme for the text. As as I'm working through this text, I I find myself just over and over saying, well, that's kind of weird. Well, that's strange. Uh, We are starting, in a sad way, somewhat uh, observing the slow descent of Saul, King Saul, ultimately into madness. Right, he's been informed last week by Samuel that uh, his kingdom is not going to be the one that's established forever, that God already has uh, someone else in mind. And so now starts this sort of slow, gradual descent by King Saul, really throughout the rest of the book, into really there's just this sad, pitiful state of, of madness. And we're not there yet. Uh, today, we're just sort of starting down that journey, and things just sort of feel a little off, feel a little weird. It's kind of like if you've been following the drama with the Eagles this, this year and you know, <laughs> right, when they bench their starting quarterback, Carson Wentz, for the rookie, uh, and then the rookie did pretty well, and so he stayed around for the next week and the next week. Like, things got a little weird with Carson Wentz. Did you notice that? Like, he all of a sudden wasn't talking to the press, but we were hearing things behind the scenes that maybe this guy's not too happy and he wants out, or maybe there's a strained relationship between him and the... So it's just weird. I, that's how I would put our relationship with, the, with Carson Wentz right now. It's just a little weird. If you ask me, that's, that's a bit of what we see uh, today in Saul. And so today's passage gives us more of this demonstration of Saul and then his son Jonathan for us to just kind of chew on and and let it kind of poke around our life. Okay, so that's sort of where we're going. Uh, let me set the scene for you. Uh, we're really picking, off quite, uh, picking up quite literally where we left off last week. Uh, the Israelites have uh, arrived for battle with the Philistines. Philistines are Israel's perpetual, nagging, oppressive en- uh, enemy at this point. Right, whenever God originally gave the Israelites the promised land, they were supposed to go in and drive out all the other surrounding nations, right? like, like get, get rid of them, get them out of God's promised land. They didn't do that. And so a lot of these nations lingered around and were a perpetual nag and threat, opposition, oppression to Israel, uh, including the Philistines. Right? We've seen them all through this book. Okay, but here's the other thing, right? Remember, going back all the way, what is it, 1 Samuel 9, where God says, okay, yeah, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to deal with this now. I've heard my people's cry. I've seen their oppression, and I'm going to deliver them. I'm going to save them from the hand of their enemies. I'm going to save them from the Philistines, and I'm raising up this guy Saul to do it. 
Okay, so that's all in the backdrop. Uh, last week they gathered for battle, and uh, sort of right where we pick it up, uh, we're in Michmash. Uh, really, really, there's this there's Michmash on the one side where the Philistines have kind of set up their garrison. That's where we left them last week. And the Philistines are on the other side of this kind of really deep ravine uh, in Geba and Gibeah. And we have Saul, and we're told that Saul is sort of camped out in a pomegranate cave. Uh, He's in there with his 600 men. Uh, If you remember in, I think it was verse 7 of last week, Uh, The Israelites, when they gathered for battle and they looked across the ravine and they saw the Philistines, it looked as if they were more numerable than the sand upon the seashore. And they know the Philistines, right? These are the Iron Kings, and so they've got really nifty weapons, and they're looking around, and they got nothing. They got their their plowshares, you know, all this stuff, right? They have no swords, no... And they panic, and they run into Israelites scatter, they go into caves, and they go into holes in the ground, they go into wells, they even go into tombs, right? And so all Saul is left with at this point is 600 troops, he's looking across, seeing at least 10,000, because they've split up into three divisions over there. So he's just sort of hanging out, kind of hedging his bets, biding his time. Oh, and he's got a priest with him, by the way. That's kind of important, relevant to the rest of the passage, It's a little curious, though, because it's Ahijah, you'd see in the text. And if you read through the text, you find out that Ahijah is the nephew of Ichabod. You remember Ichabod? Are we going back to chapter 3, 2, 3, when the Israelites initially went out for battle with the Philistines, and they kind of, you know, tried to manipulate God by bringing the Ark of the Covenant out to the front lines, and God... No, not having it. And the Philistines laid waste to them, carried the ark off into exile, and the cry of the people was, the glory has departed, such that Ichabod's mom named Ichabod that day. Ichabod, the glory has departed. His dad, Phineas, died. His grandfather, uh, Eli, died. And and see, what's interesting is God had previously said, I'm done with that line of priests. I'm done with Eli. I'm done with his sons. That's it. So it's kind of curious that we find Saul roaming around with a priest from the line of Eli. Again, text doesn't really make comment on it. It just says that there it is. Jonathan, on the other hand, uh, he's sitting there, and he's looking across the ravine, and he's seeing these Philistines over there, and... He's starting to wonder, what am I doing here? Verse 6, Jonathan said to the young man who carried his armor, Come, let us go over to the garrison of these uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us, for nothing can hinder the Lord from saving, whether by many or by few. And his armor bearer said to him, Well, do all that is in your heart. Do as you wish. Behold, I am with you heart and soul. And then Jonathan said, well, behold, we'll cross over to the men and we'll show ourselves to them. If they say to us, wait until we come down to you, then we'll stand still in our place and we'll not go up to them. But if they say, come on up to us, then we'll go up and we'll know that the Lord has given them into our hands. Right, so Jonathan, presumably, he understands what God is up to. He understands what they're doing out there. God has said, I'm going to deal with the Philistines, right? And he understands his role in this. I'm I'm a soldier. I'm a servant in in God's kingdom. That's what I'm here. And did you pick up too, like, Jonathan, he's he's keenly aware of the promises that God has made to his people. He calls the Philistines over there those uncircumcised, which is not just a crude insult. It's saying, well, what, what was circumcision? It was the sign of this covenant relationship that God had with his people. It was a sign of this covenant where God said, look, I'm going to be your God. You're going to be my people. I'm going to give you a land. I'm going to cause you to be fruitful and multiply. I'm going to secure you in that land. I'm going to deal with your enemies. I'm going to provide for you. And so here's Jonathan saying, hey, we're the people of promise. They're the uncircumcised people over there. He's got a great theology too. I know God can save. He doesn't need all the people that are hiding in caves, he doesn't need, you know, swords and shields. He doesn't need 600 of Saul's people in the pomegranate cave. He can save by many or by few. And so all this leads Jonathan to say, what am I doing over here? Come on, let, let, 
he says to his armors, Bear, let's go over there. So he climbs down his, you know, the ravine, ravine from Gibeah and Gibeah and starts to work his way up the other side, a micmash a little bit. And, you know, and he shows himself. They show himself to the, the Philistines up there and they say, Look, these Hebrews, these dogs, they're finally coming out of their caves and they're finally coming out of their holes in the ground. And they say to him, Come on up here. We'll show you a thing or two. And Jonathan says, bingo, <laughs> I gotcha. And so, verse 13, Jonathan climbed up on his hands and feet and his armor bearer after him. And they fell before Jonathan and his armor bearer killed them after him. At that first strike, what Jonathan and his armor bearer made, they killed about 20 men within, as it were, a half a furrow's length in an acre of land. And there was a panic in the camp, in the field, and among all the people, the garrison, and even the raiders trembled. The earth quaked, and it became a very great panic. Right? It becomes clear that, yeah, sure enough, Jonathan is not fighting this battle on his own. God has purposes and tensions. He's certainly strong enough to do it. So Jonathan takes out 20 of them, and God's at work there, and he throws them all into a panic. And the ground quakes. Right, so I just want you to observe that about Jonathan, just that connection between, well, I, I know what God's doing, I know what he's up to, and I know what he can do. I imagine Jonathan, you know, he, re, he remembers probably the stories, you know, from his younger days when he heard about how, I don't know, when the Israelites were gathered at, at mitzvah, and they were praying, and the Philistines marched up for battle against them, and the Israelites had nothing with which to wage war, yet God thundered from heaven, threw them into confusion, and routed them right in front of them. Or maybe Jonathan remembers the stories about how when they captured the ark, and they tried passing it around from city to city, all they, they got were plagues and boils, and how God utterly humiliated, embarrassed their God Dagon, and I remember he, or maybe he remembers stories through the wilderness or stories back in Egypt, all to say that God doesn't need many. If he wants to save, he can save by a few. And so he crosses the ravine, goes up, and sure enough, God's with him, strikes down 20, throws the whole camp into confusion. So much so, the Saul, back in the pomegranate cave, uh, he hears this, and he looks out, and he sees some of the confusion that's going on over in the hill in the company of the Philistines, and he hears... You know, maybe they're turning against themselves. And so he, he, he says, priest, priest, come over, get over here. Oh, and bring the ephod. Uh, the ephod was uh, the priest's garment, his robe. And on the ephod, they, it either, it's hard to know at this stage of the game whether they have these, the, the Urim and the Thummim. And we don't know if they're actually attached to the ephod at this point or maybe in a pouch that he would pull out. Basically, these stones. And they would use these stones sometimes by casting lots or, you know, or whatever to try to discern what God's purposes for them were. Right? And so Saul, he says to the priest, priest, get over here and grab the ephod. And let's find out, is now the time when I take my measly 600 guys and we go and we storm the 10,000 you know, or so Philistines up on the hill over there? You know, but then what happens is the confusion gets even greater over the hill. There's cries, there's screaming. He can see from a distance that they're all turning in on themselves. And so he actually says this to the priest. He says, ah, never mind. Take your hand off the stones. We're actually just going to go. Which could be curious, could be strange. I don't know. On the one hand, he's interested in discerning of the Lord when it looks a little sketchy. But when it seems like he can take care of it or whatever, off he goes. I don't, I don't want to make too much of that. Again, the text doesn't. It just looks a little weird, maybe. So they go over, start routing the Philistines, sure enough. So much so that the people come, you know, peeking their heads out of the caves and out of the, the wells and the holes in the ground. They're saying, hey, look at what Jonathan's doing. Look at what Saul's doing. And so they come all from all corners and they get in on the action. So much so that in verse 23, so the Lord saved Israel that day and the battle passed beyond beth Avon. Basically, they routed the Philistines, sent them in a massive retreat, and are in hot pursuit all the way down into beth Avon. Squeaky floor here. <laughs> anyway, uh, where was I? Okay, so this is where it starts to get a little strange now, or even more weird. Saul, uh, you know, the battle's not done yet. 
or, or, the, or the job isn't finished. The, the Philistines aren't completely laid to waste, right? They're in, they're in retreat, and the, Phil, and the Israelites are in hot pursuit, and Saul wants to, you know, deal the death blow to them. But so he makes this strange command to the Israelites. He, he, calls, he calls for a fast. Verse 24, the men of Israel had been hard-pressed that day, but Saul laid an oath on the people, saying, Cursed be the man who eats food until it is evening, and I am avenged on my enemies. So none of the people tasted any food. And when the people came to the forest, behold, there was honey on the ground. And when the people entered the forest, behold, the honey was dripping, literally. But no one put his hand to his mouth, for the people feared the oath that Saul had made. Uh, when we were out in Gettysburg, I liked to go over to the battlefield and I liked to learn, you know, about the, the battle and how the soldiers, you know, and the companies arranged themselves for war and where everybody came from. One thing that always struck me is, man, these people, these soldiers had incredible endurance. <laughs> I mean, they would come from 10, 20, 30 miles to the south in Maryland and Virginia because they heard that, hey, hey we're, we're, we're garnering for battle up here. They need reinforcements. So companies would come marching through the heat of midsummer, July, in <laughs> wool attire all day long so that they could fight in battle that evening. <laughs> right? I walk for 20, 30 miles. I'm ready to sleep for the rest of the day. These people are walking 20, 30 miles, ready to be engaged in battle. Right? And I had this in mind uh, as I'm reading this text. Here you have the Israelites. They've been in, in conflict, in battle all day. Now they're on the march or on the run. They're chasing the Philistines down. And it's just a weird time for Saul to some say, and nobody eat anything. <laughs> You're hungry? Deal with it. On the one hand, look, it could be Saul saying, the job's not done. God has commissioned us to deal with the Philistines to deliver his people, and we're not going to stop until the job's done. We're not going to stop for dinner. We're going to go until the job is finished. And if you get hungry, we're going to wait on the Lord, and we're going to rely on him for strength, and we're going to rely on him for nourishment, and he'll give the Philistines into our hands. That may be. Except it gets a little muddy when Saul comes and says, nobody eats until I'm avenged on my enemies. Right, almost so that you know you might start to ask, well, what are we doing here, Saul? Is this about you know securing God's kingdom and fulfilling His command and His purpose for us, or is this about somehow you know you securing your kingdom and us dealing with the opposition? Again, we don't know. The text doesn't say, but it's just strange time to call for a fast. The problem with the fast, or, or, or so they're going through the woods. Honey is literally literally dripping from the the. the wherever it drips from. <laughs> and honey would have been like the great uh, fast food snack. It's like a Snickers bar. Like Snickers are literally dripping into their hands. And they could stop and eat and just take a, the Snickers on their journey. But Saul said, don't touch anything. So they're, they're not even licking the honey that's on their hands. Except Jonathan somehow didn't hear the, they didn't hear the command. And so sure enough, he's grabbing some of the honey. He's getting his carb fix. <laughs> He's getting all ready to roll, and the people look at him and say, oh, no, you didn't. <laughs> Verse 28, your father strictly charged the people with an oath, saying, cursed be the man who eats food this day. And the people were faint. <laughs> and Jonathan said, my father has troubled the land. Look, see how my eyes have become bright because I tasted a little of this honey. How much better if the people had eaten freely today of the spoil of their enemies that they found for now, the defeat among the Philistines has not been so great. And Jonathan seems to be saying, hey, look, if we just paused, man, we could have really routed these Philistines more so than we have. Uh, as it is, uh, verse 31, they struck down the Philistines that day from Michmash to uh, Aijalon. Uh, evening comes, the oath is lifted, people are free to eat. And so they go and they start taking from the spoil of the Philistines, right? Their oxes and their cattle and their sheep that, you know, the Philistines are left behind. And they 
slaughter these animals, and they start to have a great barbecue, right? They're going to eat. They're going to fill up. They're going to be nourished and satisfied finally. Only the problem is they're so hungry, they're so faint, they're so tired that they don't even have, they don't even stop to, to drain the blood, right? Or to put it in contemporary terms, maybe if you will, uh, they're, they're running up to the, to the barbecue and they're not waiting for everything to be well done, or they're not doing like my wife does when we go out to eat and she gets a hamburger and sends it back two or three times until it literally comes out looking like a hockey puck, right? They're not doing that. They're grabbing it raw. They're grabbing it rare. They're so hungry. They're so famished. They're just taking it and they're eating it. And the problem is, in Israelite law, Leviticus 17 and stuff, you can't do that. The blood is the life of the animal. The life was given by God. The life belongs to God. And so God says, drain the blood out of the animal before you eat it. Don't go eating the blood. Saul gets word of what's going on. Says, you got to be kidding me, guys. You're going to come eat this blood, which we know we're not supposed to do. So now we got to stop. Now we got to build an altar. So he goes and gets some big stones. He builds an altar. We're told in the text it's the first time he's ever built an altar, but he's going to build an altar now. And he tells everybody, get your oxes, get all your sheep, bring them to this altar. We're going to have a big old sacrifice. Presumably, Ahijah, the priest, I don't know, offers the sacrifice. Uh, and then he says, okay, so here's the deal then. Uh, the Philistines, you know, they're down camp down there for the night, but let's not give up. Let's go get them. Let's go pursue the Philistines. Uh, and we will, you know, by morning light, this thing will all be said and done. The Philistines will be handed over and we'll have defeated them squarely. The people say, all right, let's go. Uh, but the, heat, the priest comes and says, well, hold on. Shouldn't we, shouldn't we inquire of God first? Great idea, says Saul. Go get, the, go get the ephod. Go get the Urim and the Thurman. And so they ask of God, so they, you know, should, we, should we go and pursue the Philistines, right? No answer. I don't know, maybe they do it again, maybe a third time. No answer. Oh, man, Saul is all worked up about this. What do you mean there's no answer? Something has gone wrong. One of you all have clearly messed up Sin somehow such that God is no longer talking to us and doggone it, I'm going to find out who and he makes another oath. Whoever is to blame for this, you're, you're going down. You're going, to, you're going to die. It's curious. There's no, no sense at all in Saul that the problem could be anywhere on his side of things or whatever. You know. Uh, no, no sense at all that maybe God is not always at his beck and call or maybe no sense at all that, hey, last time you called on God, you actually are the one to hung, hang up on him. So maybe he's not picking up right now. Or no sense that, hey, you're roaming around with a defunct priest that I don't exactly listen to anymore. Or no sense of last week's chapter where Samuel said you have sinned uh, terribly against the Lord and he's moving on from you, right? None of that. It's clearly somebody out there is to blame for this and we're going to find it and here's my second oath, you're going to die. Grab those urim and thum, cast them out. on the. Well, no, first what he does, he says, come here, Jonathan, come stand by me, my boy. It'll be us against all of them cast the lots, assuming that it's going to land on the people out there, and we'll start whittling it down. But don't you know he cast the lots, and it falls to him and Jonathan. So you grab it again, and cast the lot again, and it falls to Jonathan. So I says to Jonathan, Jonathan, what have you done? And Jonathan said, well, I tasted a little honey with the tip of the staff that was in my hand. Here I am. I will die. And Saul said, God, do so to me and more also. You shall surely die, Jonathan. Which, by the way, at the very least, we can say something is changing in Saul. Right, do you remember a couple chapters ago after they beat the Ammonites? And they, you know, dealt with Nahash, the snake. And... You know, everybody's celebrating this great work of salvation that God had done for the people. Uh, so much so, they're coming around, hail to Saul, hail to the king. And then they're also saying, and yeah, you know what? Let's go get some of those sons of Belial who didn't believe that you could save us. And who weren't trusting you and who weren't falling after. Let's go get them and put them to death. And what does Saul say? No, 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 we're not doing that. 
Today is a day for rejoicing in God's great salvation to us. Not a man shall die today. Well, whatever the case, something has changed because here's another great day of salvation that God has worked very dramatically against the Philistines. And now Saul is all too ready to say, oh, I'll we'll put some people to death. I'll even put my own son to death. But then verse 45, the people said to Saul, Shall Jonathan die who has worked this great salvation in Israel? Far from it. As the Lord lives, there shall not one hair of his head fall to the ground, for he has worked with God this day. And so the people ransomed Jonathan so that he did not die. And then Saul went up from pursuing the Philistines, and the Philistines went to their own place. And so that's how it ends. People... You know, finally speak up and say, hold on a second here, Saul. God has worked. They do what Saul did last time. God has worked this great salvation. It's Jonathan who's partnered with them. Uh, Jonathan's not going to die today. And Saul, whatever, he, he gives in to that. And, and, and that's where the story ends. That he doesn't pursue the Philistines, and the Philistines go back their way. So we are left with the sense that the job is not done. And you would expect at this point... Uh, for the narrator to step in and say, because maybe Saul, you know, didn't let the people eat, or maybe because Saul made this rash vow or whatever, eh, the job just fell apart and they didn't get to finish it. But it doesn't say that. It actually goes on to say in verse 47, when Saul had taken the kingship, he fought against all his enemies on every side, against Moab, the Ammonites, Edom, the kings of Zobah and against the Philistines, and wherever he turned, he routed them, and he did valiant, valiantly. Again, which is all to say, the text isn't coming in and saying, Saul, really bad. Jonathan, really good. <laughs> it leaves us just in this, it's just weird, it's just strange. And so again, <laughs> we're left thinking, okay, so what do we do with this? How do, how do, what, do we, what do we make of this? And for me, it really just comes down to, uh, to making some observations. Just making some very patent, clear observations. The first of which is this. Isn't it just a little weird that all of a sudden, Saul has become hyper-religious? You notice that? I mean, remember too, Saul, the guy when we first found him, seemed to really not be reli- all, any, all that religious at all. Right, remember, he was the one when they're out looking for their donkeys and they can't find them. He's ready to throw in the towel and go home. It's his servant who says, hey, you know what? We're near this town where there's a man of God. And I've heard good things about this man of God. Let's go talk to him. And it's Saul who says, eh, but we don't really have anything to give him. That's just probably going to be a waste of time. And he, the guy says, no, I, I've got a couple shekels. I'll give it to him. Let's go. Let's go talk to them. Right? It's, 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 the, it's the servant boy who brings Saul into the company of religious activity or whatever. But now all of a sudden, something has dramatically shifted, and Paul, or Saul has become hyper-religious. All right? He's walking around with a priest, a hija, everywhere he goes. He's grabbing the urim and thurim and, and using them whenever he can. He's calling for fasts. He's building altars and making sacrifices. He's making these oaths that surely somebody will die today. He's even willing to sacrifice his beloved son. You know, and I guess I would say that that often happens. You know, when people feel like life has, you know, become unsettled. Or if people feel like their little kingdom that they've built for themselves or the kingdom that they've been handed, inherited, or whatever, just the little kingdom life that they have, that they've secured for themselves, if all of a sudden that's become a little uncertain or a little bit shaky, uh, maybe they get a little bit religious. <laughs> Start engaging in certain religious practices to see if, uh, you know, appealing to the gods will help them out a little bit. Or even more, if people somehow get a little bit of a haunting sense that maybe things aren't quite peachy <laughs> between me and God. You know, maybe they get a little bit religious. You know, sort of like Saul. I would imagine it's a little bit of both. Saul, he's told, hey, your kingdom's not going to endure, and things are not quite right between you and God. And so all of a sudden, he gets super religious, and he's doing all these practices and things. But you, you sort of get the sense, I, we don't, I'm not really sure if Paul is do, Saul is doing all this religious stuff because he's, you know, whatever, trying to resubmit himself to God, or if he's trying to get God resubmitted to to him. 
And I think that's oftentimes a lot of, or I'll say it this way, that that is the thing, that sometimes people can be running far away from God and at the same time getting hyper-religious and doing all sorts of religious practices, going to church, giving money in their offering, maybe even reading their Bible, all the while running far away from God. It can, it can happen. We've seen it in the Israelites, Right? The whole first part of 1 Samuel, it's that story. The Israelites, hyper-religious, going up to Shiloh, bringing their sacrifices year after year, consulting the priests, doing all this stuff, and yet doing what was right in their own eyes. Everybody living life on their own terms. Right, or even Saul. Uh, last week, you know, Samuel coming confronting him for his sin telling him your kingdom's going to be taken from you. And yeah, we see him getting all religious, but look what we don't see him doing. Look, we don't see him all of a sudden being heartbroken over his sinfulness. Right? We don't see Saul calling a fast for himself. You know, so that he would feel some of the, the heaviness of his sin, so that he would be, you know, facilitated in a deep lament over his sin. We don't see Saul building an altar and going and grabbing any of his, his father's sheep or donkeys or whatever he can and coming and laying it on the altar to by any means possible atone for the sin he's committed, right? This altar he builds here is the first altar he's ever made. Or we don't see Saul making some sort of oath. Hey, there's been terrible sin that's taken place. I'm to blame, and if that gets in the way of what God's doing, then I need to die, right? None of that. We only see Saul getting hyper-religious when it seems like maybe his kingdom is threatened. Or the favor that he once enjoyed with God, which secured his kingdom, is now in question. Which again is all to say that that's a thing, right? People can be running far away from God, doing life on their own terms, living what is right in their own eyes, getting super religious, coming to church, reading their Bible perhaps, all good things, but maybe not how do you want to say it, posturing themselves in submission to that word or in submission to what God might be wanting to do in their lives through the church, right? Not allowing the word to, you know, do its sometimes painful work of exposing dark things that might be going on in their heart and life or not letting the word expose that, hey, they're in a pretty desperate and needy situation and they, are, they actually are very desperate, whether they realize it or not, for the redeeming work that God has put forth for them in Jesus Christ. We're allowing the word to actually stir in them, you know, faith and celebration and thankfulness for what God has done for them and his redeeming work through Christ. In other words, a lot of times people can do this, can come to church, go, you know, spend time in the word, not as an act of submitting themselves to what it is God would want to do in and through them life, in and through their lives, but maybe more as an act of trying to get God more aligned and more submitted to their purposes and to their kingdoms that they've built up, right? Making sure all their bets are hedged and maybe God will be on our side in this. All right, and so if by chance that's you this morning or if you're just visiting with the fir- us for the first time and you're curious about you know, Christ or church or, or worship and all that, right? Uh, you know, the challenge for you is, yeah, just be careful, right? You can get engaged in all sorts of religious activity and still be running far away from God. The invitation is uh, to come and to posture yourself in submission to what it is God is doing in your life, what God might be calling you to or, accompl- or wanting to accomplish for you and as he reveals himself to you in his word and through the ministry of the word and his people in the church. And then here's the really good news. Is that as you submit to that word, as you recognize your need of it, as you recognize your need of his grace, his redeeming mercy in your life, the great news is it's not about then all this religious stuff that you do to somehow make God happy or appease him or soften him to your case or your side. The great news is is that he's already done it. He was willing to sacrifice his beloved son because of his great commitment and love to you, so that you wouldn't have to die, so that you wouldn't have to suffer for your sinfulness. So the invitation is to entrust your life to to him and to that great God of mercy and grace. 
And to the rest of us who have done that, uh, for me, I would say Jonathan leaves us with a little bit of a challenge this morning. Right? Jonathan, he's this great, in my eyes, he's this great demonstration of the life of faith. Right? Here's Jonathan. He knows what God's up to. He knows his role. He is God's kingdom servant. He knows God's promises that, hey, I'm going to give you your, I'm, I'm going to deal with your enemies right in front of you. And uh, he knows of God's power. He's got great theology. God doesn't need me. He doesn't need anybody. He can save by many or a few. And all of this leads Jonathan to say, what am I doing here on the sidelines? Like, I need to get in the action. I need to go up and take that hill. I need to advance the kingdom. Right? And that's a challenge for me, for us, because we're, that's where we are. We're in Jonathan's shoes, essentially, right? The king has, well, we know what the king is up to, right? He sacrificed his life. He laid down his life for the redemption of his people, uh, for the redemption of the world that which, in which he loves, right? So we know what he's doing. We know his mission, his purpose. We know his power, right? Because the king has been raised victoriously over death, all that Satan, all that the opposition could throw against him, he triumphed dramatically over in the resurrection. We know the incredible promises that are ours in Christ, right? This glorious inheritance of the saints, of new creation and resurrection life to the full. We know all of that. And we know our role, right? We know our responsibility. We're his treasured possession, his royal priesthood called to declare the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. We're a sent people sent to make disciples. We're a sent people sent to be, as Paul would say, ambassadors, making Christ's case, appealing people to be reconciled to to God through Jesus Christ. We're a sent people sent to Love our neighbor sacrificially, to do justice and to, do, and to love mercy. We're, we're a sent people sent to follow the way of the king in announcing good news to the, bo- the poor and recovery of sight to the blind and uh, the year of God's favor to those who are impressed and imprisoned. Right? We know what God's up to. We know the power. We know the promises and we know our responsibility. So it's like with Saul or with Jonathan, why in the world would we sit on the sidelines? And hear me out, I'm not saying this to add a guilt trip this morning and say, well, you need to be doing more for the kingdom and all that. I'm just saying, I look at Jonathan and there's something just appealing about Jonathan to me. <laughs> I don't know if it's just, you know, being cooped up and, you know, COVID quarantine for too long. Maybe I'm in a midlife crisis. I don't know. But there's something appealing about Jonathan who, who knows the story, who knows his faith, who knows his theology, who knows his confession, and he says, so what am I doing here? Let me get out in the battle. Let me see this firsthand. Let's see what God will do. Boy, and I think that's, I, I feel like the, the guys coming, peeking their heads out of the cave, watching Jonathan, you know, or watching Saul going and I say, oh yeah, maybe I can come out of my cave too. Or maybe I can come out of my well of this tomb that I've been hiding in and get in on this kingdom activity. Yeah, maybe I can be a little bit more active in my home and, and be a great, greater servant of the kingdom, advancing God's kingdom in my home. Or maybe in my workplace, I take more effort or I, I look at my workplace the way Jonathan looks at the battlefield and think, how can I advance the kingdom? Or maybe I look at my neighborhood and think, man, how can these people go through life without the hope and the promise and the power of God, how can I be used to advance all that? That's why we come to worship, folks, right? We don't come doing all this religious stuff to earn God's favor, to get him to look favorably upon us. We come to worship to be reminded that God is up to something pretty empower, pretty incredible. He's got great promises that we need to remember. He's got great power that he promises to arm us with, and we've got this great calling so that when we walk out that door, man, we're sent as ambassadors, representatives, servants, and so we go out that door. As the old hymn says, let goods and kindred go, this mortal life also, the body they may kill, but God's truth abides still. His kingdom is forever. So let's go get in on that. And we pray that in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So here's the deal. At this point, uh, we're going to transition to celebrating the Lord's Supper.
Again, not as just an empty religious exercise. This is something we're going to do to make God happy. But we're, we're going to transition to the Lord's Supper as spiritual armament for when we head out that door. And, and we, yeah, we get like Jonathan. We want to get into the kingdom mission, right? This is how we remember. Remember his promises. Remember his covenant. This is how we feed on him. So actually what we're going to do is uh, we're going to shut down the live stream. And if anybody would like to uh, celebrate communion with us at home, uh, there's going to be a link that comes up uh, that will, uh, you can click to get in on a, a Zoom or Ring Central meeting, and uh, we're going to bring you in on that way. So we're going to take a pause here. Uh, the folks are going to bring out the elements to the table. The worship team's going to come back up. We're going to transition all the technical stuff. And uh, once we're ready, we'll sing, we'll pray. We'll celebrate the elements together, and uh, we'll go from there. So if you'd like to join with us, click on your Ring ring Central uh, link there, and please turn your cameras on so we can uh, celebrate together.